So starting from where I left you in the last lecture, where we did discuss a couple of uh, the fundamental forces which occur in nature and they were the long range forces, gravitation and electromagnetic. Now, as I told you that the property of a particle is one property is its mass and the other property is its charge. And then in the case of mass, two masses, we have a force of attraction. In the case of two particles, two masses which carry charge, of course the charge I told you it can be positive, it can be negative and we go by the convention of uh, the positive and negative charges as was explained and suggested and later on it was adopted uh, and the man was Benjamin Franklin, an American and uh, since then we have a particle has got a positive charge or a negative charge or uh, is uh, neutral charge wise etc which we will have occasion to discuss when we uh, talk about gravitation and electromagnetism in details. These are long range plus short range forces. Now what is short? And short is important, we must discuss short. What is short? If we are comparing one centimeter to 100 kilometers, then the one centimeter is can be said to be short as compared to the longer length. But here actually what we have to do is, I will just tell you, give you a glimpse of what is there in an atom. As you know, an atom comprises of a nucleus and a cloud of electrons around the nucleus. This nucleus is positively charged, positive in charge because the residents of the nucleus are protons and neutrons. Protons, protons which carry a positive charge and neutrons which carry zero charge and they live together in the nucleus. Now the diameter of a nucleus, diameter, <coughs> diameter of a nucleus, nucleus is of the order of 10 to the power of minus 15 meters, which is femtometers, 10 to the power of minus 15 meters is 1 divided by 1 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 0 okay. So this is a very short distance the confines of the nucleus which also we can take the round body uh, like an atom which we take uh, also as a round body I said that there is a cloud of electrons which is moving around the nucleus around the nucleus and electrons are negatively charged 
the charge on the protons is positive and the charge on the neutrons is zero and the charge on the electrons electrons is negative this is positive and this is negative so first of all i'll tell you that the magnitude of the charge on a single electron and that on a single proton is the same and as you know that this charge is 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 19 coulombs and a coulomb a single coulomb of charge is an enormous charge a very big charge so when we do problems of charges in the uh, Coulomb's law and related topics, then the values that we take, they are normally in micro Coulombs. Uh, this is Coulombs. So micro Coulombs, nano Coulombs, pico Coulombs, these are the values. And you must see what the meaning of, uh, like micro it is 10 to the power of minus 6. Nano it is 10 to the power of minus 9 and pico is 10 to the power of minus 12. So these values are there. The diameter of an atom, diameter of an atom is approximately 10 to the power of minus 10 meters. Okay. It is still very, very, very small. So look at that. The short range forces, which we call the strongest of the forces, the strong nuclear force. Okay. How far this force is confined? This force can act maximum to a distance of the distance between a proton and an, a neutron or proton and proton, neutron and neutron, that is very, very, very small. Even smaller than this 10 to the power of minus uh, 15. So in that range, the strong nuclear force acts. It is independent of the whether the body is charged or not. It is a force between a neutron and neutron, neutron and proton, proton and another proton, <coughs> which are known as, because they stay in the nucleus, they are called nucleons. And that is why these are the nuclear forces. The strong force is the strongest force in nature, which if I just take, in a certain unit uh, as 10 to the power of minus 0 which is equal to 1 then the next strong force is the electromagnetic which is 10 to the power of minus 2 and then the weak nuclear force which is uh, used to uh, explain the radioactive decay uh, when alpha beta and gamma rays, where alpha is an electromagnetic wave, the beta and gamma are particles that are uh, emitted out of the nucleus when there is radioactivity. That to explain that we go for the weak nuclear force, more so in class 12 <coughs> when we deal with uh, the nucleus and the function of these forces. <coughs> the weak forces 10 to the power of minus 13. That means compared to the weak force, if weak force is taken as 1, then a strong nuclear force will be taken as 10 to the power of plus 13. <coughs> now see here, look, if a body falls on my head, half a kilogram, even from a distance of a couple of meters, I'm going to be injured. 
I'm going to be injured badly. But this force is seen here to be very, very, very weak. As compared to the strong force, this is 10 to the power of minus 38. Or the strong nuclear force for the same distances between the same particles uh, is about 10 to the power of 38 times the gravitational force. And 10 to the power of 38 is a large, large, large number. It's a big number. So these are some of the forces. Now, not very long back, it was, there was a force which is, uh, which was called elastic force and that was also described but elastic force is not a fundamental force. The, the fundamental forces in nature are four and the gravitational, the electromagnetic which are long range as well as uh, short range and weak and strong nuclear forces which reside, which have their value inside the nucleus. If somebody asks you what is the, uh, can you tell me as to what is the strong nuclear force between two particles, a, a proton and a neutron separated by 10 centimeters, the answer is always zero. Okay, one centimeter, the answer is always zero. Even these atomic dimensions, 10 to the power of minus 10 uh, meters, it is equal to zero. It is of some value only when it is within the confines of the tiny nucleus, the very strong nucleus, which carries the mass of the atom. And of course, regarding the mass, <coughs> the mass of the electrons is about 1 upon 1860 times the mass of either a proton or a neutron. And the masses of these two bodies, I'm sorry, these two particles is almost equal. We will have the occasion to come back to these things. I just wanted to give you a glimpse of what the forces are. And the next item which is very important before I uh, move on is again the discussion of linear momentum. And I'm going to talk about the linear momentum uh, of body uh, and the law of conservation of linear momentum. The law of conservation of linear momentum, it comes, I will discuss again from the same fundamental uh, the relation that we obtained for the second law where I said that F the force is equal to mass, I'm sorry, acceleration multiplied by the mass. Okay. I didn't write MA, I just write the acceleration of the body multiplied by the mass. Okay. And which we wrote as uh, now I, I put M here and this turns out to be equal to dv dt. Acceleration is defined as because acceleration is equal to ddt of rate of change of time rate of change of the velocity vector. Okay. And since we take in this discussion and before also, I did show to you the mass is almost invariant, it does not change. So I can multiply with this scalar inside and I get this as equal to DDT of MV, where by definition this MV is P, so I can write it as DP dt. Correct or no? 
Is this expression okay? The answer is no. This is nonsense unless I describe it as vector p. So f is equal to dp dt. For a certain mass m moving with the velocity v, I write this as rate of change of momentum and this is also the definition of the second law as I defined to you but now I am saying if if f is equal to 0 ok if f is 0 then naturally I can write dp dt dp dt is equal to 0 which gives us the which helps us to say that p is a constant p is an invariant so p is equal to a constant an invariant does not change and that we say that the p is uh, conserved so this is for any any system where the system as a whole can be said to be this mass may comprise of billions and billions of particles which may be vibrating inside which may be in contact with other atoms so atoms are making a colony or atoms are making a city of themselves and that is an object a certain mass. So, if you understand this, I can then take up the system of a uh, couple of masses. Suppose I have a confined system, I, a system that I uh, beforehand, I call it uh, an isolated system and suppose I have an isolated system and in this isolated uh, confine I have two masses I have two masses one is M1 and the other is M2 okay these are two masses where uh, the associated momentum over here is P1 and the momentum over here is P2. Okay. So I can say like before that my momentum P may be equal to the momentum P may be equal to P1 plus P2 plus P2. The two bodies <coughs> have momentum to be P1 and P2 and we get the total momentum is equal to P. I say that this particle is moving towards this particle with the velocity V1 and <coughs> This one is also moving to this with the velocity v2. There is a force f. If I call this Mr. 1, then I will write this force. The force on body 1 due to body 2 and a force on body 2, if I call this Mr. 2, then or if the girls feel offended then this is miss one and miss two okay so 
this is the confined system in which we have two forces F12 and F21. There are corresponding accelerations. Of course, the acceleration will also be in the same direction. So I can say that the direction of my P on M1 will be something like this. This is P1 and the direction of the P2 will also be in the opposite direction and this I can write as P2 etc. So I can write that F12 is equal to, so I can write F12 as equal to DDT rate of change of P1 okay P1 and F21 as equal to DDT of P2 the two uh, I'm sorry, I have to write P2, I can put it like this in brackets and put it like this in brackets. And now, what we have in this system is that F12 is equal to, for a system of two particles, this F12 is equal to minus F21. This is what we discussed in the discussion on the Newton's third law. Naturally, I can write, if I bring it on this side, that therefore F12 plus F21 F21 is equal to I can write these definitions DDT of P1 DDT of P1 plus DDT of P2 it's of course equal to 0 DDT of P2 and the operation DDT if we take that separately, I can write this as DDT of DDT rate of time rate of change of the, sorry, I again wrote it wrong, again wrote it wrong. So this is equal to DDT of P1 plus P2. is finally everything is equal to zero okay so it is equal to zero so that means that p1 plus p2 is a constant p1 plus p2 i write here p1 plus p2 is equal to is equal to zero. So for a system of two particles we find that the sum of the momenta and look here while this is happening while I said that these two particles were put at certain locations at a certain separation so that if they are left free these particles will move towards each other, these masses will uh, move towards each other with uh, the velocity, I am sorry, this is V2, okay, so with velocities in opposite direction and that means the total momentum P1, M V1 plus m2 v2 is equal to 0. The momentum does not change in the absence of force. So the major thing about this law of conservation is 
that now suppose instead of what we have taken as two particles maybe there are a number of particles and if suppose the number of particles is n and then we can have the total this is what I can write therefore that P in sum of all these equal to 0 and if there are n particles I can write that my total P because of each other is equal to P1 plus P2 plus and so on plus Pn for the total number of particles being equal to Pn. So this is also is a constant. And this is what is we call, that is, in the system, if there is no net force on the system, no net external force on the system, the, and if the force is there, for example, if uh, I want to drop, uh, okay, I have a bottle, it's empty, I can drop it. So if somebody says that you can observe the, drop of a bottle and during this drop during this fall is the law of conservation of momentum holding then the answer is no the law of conservation of momentum is not holding at all because we are just talking about the motion of one body but if someone says no the force acting on this body is mg it is falling towards the earth and because this force has an equal and opposite counterpart on the earth when this is falling during the motion of this body the earth will definitely definitely it will fall towards this body because if not then the fundamental law the fundamental principle of conservation of momentum in the absence of an external force will be violated. So in this case there are two bodies one is the falling bottle and the other is the earth which is falling in that duration at every moment of time at every moment of time and the earth falls towards the body and the body falls towards the earth so that the conservation principle is uh, maintained and of course the conservation principle uh, depends upon the absence of an external force. So when we talk about the falling body and the falling earth, okay, or bouncing earth, whatever you want to say, uh, so we can say that the because on this system no external force is acting. If we assume that, if you presume that, if you can subscribe to that, then in that case there is a law of conservation of momentum and the law of conservation of momentum always holds. Okay? Now momentum depends upon the mass of the body and also of the velocity of the body. So when while my bottle was falling, the velocity you have just seen that it might be a few meters per second but because the earth on which it is exerting a force in the upward direction that is very 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 massy body the body being very massy huge therefore the velocity that may occur you can calculate but there will be a velocity towards it and you can make calculations make discussions and see how the momentum conservation holds. For example, this law, this principle, suppose I have a gun, suppose I have a gun and you know that when the gun is shot and the bullet moves in, the, in this direction, then for me and the bullet, the system that we have 
the net momentum of the system is equal to zero. Therefore, there is a concept when this is going forward, then I will go backward. There is a velocity of recoil. There are so many examples of the law of conservation of momentum in the absence of an external force, which we may talk. But I invite you to go through your book, and if you have any difficulty, uh, of course. Now, next time we meet, I'm going to do as many problems as we can do, as many situations as are there. We'll discuss about the first, second, and third law, okay? And also the principle of conservation of momentum. And uh, then we'll talk about something which is called impulse, a beauty. Impulse is a very beautiful concept and it is equal to force multiplied by the time for which the force is acting on a body. Okay. So nailing on a wood plank, that requires an idea of the impulse. So long, wish you all the best.